Hi everyone, how are you doing? I'm okay. I, I've been feeling a little bit glum recently uh, for reasons which I'm sure everyone understands and appreciates and probably feels the same way during this time of lockdown. And, you know, I've been trying to do what you're, you're supposed to be doing of, of staying active and involved in things online. And uh, so I've been having lots of video chats uh, in the evenings with friends and family, and which has been really lovely. And this morning I woke up early, so I, uh, I baked a batch of rhubarb and water walnut muffins uh, using a Nigella Lawson recipe that I really love and uh, so but although the problem with baking uh, when you're home stuck at home alone and can't see anyone else is that then you just have all this baking which you have to eat um, or it's just gonna go to waste so now I have 12 muffins for me and my partner to share between us which is quite a lot so I wish I could share some of these with you because yeah that that would be lovely and uh, and I have started doing a regular workout routine in the morning where a friend of Mine has been doing Joe Wick's uh, exercise videos in the mornings uh, on on YouTube, and so uh, so it's been fun joining him doing doing that, and you know to get a little bit of exercise at least rather than just sitting around all the time. But I have found it's been a bit harder to read recently, and and I think a lot of people have been talking about this feeling online. Even though we have all this time to read, uh, there just isn't as much. Uh, inclination um, just so easy to be distracted and and I think it is this feeling of uh, just sort of aimlessness and it's hard to remember that there's much to sort of look forward to and that we can't make long-term plans into the future either uh, going to visit people or or uh, or sort of moving on with our lives or going on holidays or you know making any big life decisions like changing jobs or, or moving where you live and and all of these things and so I think yeah, this just all has a cumulative effect, um, as well as, you know, this impending sense of, of doom of that a lot of people are sick and a lot of people are dying and that uh, society is on the brink of an economic collapse and you know all of this this pressure is just sort of getting to to me as I know it is getting to everyone else so I thought what could I do today to sort of escape from all of this and I thought I would talk about some books that I am looking forward to reading because I think you know it's not disingenuous even if you're not reading all that much it's still lovely to uh, look at books that you might want to read soon in the future and you know I found myself just watching booktube videos Videos sometimes and you know that's that's a really big help so uh, so yeah I thought I'd make another video today of a book haul and look at a number of books and the first one I want to talk about is a book which I think might be surprisingly topical even though it's a historical novel set at the beginning of the 1800s uh, that's The Year Without Summer by Guinevere Glassford and this is a novel uh, that is about in 1815, there was a volcano which uh, went off in Indonesia, a really big volcanic explosion, and it created such a giant cloud of ash in the atmosphere that it basically went over the entire globe. And so during the, the summer, um, there the sun was sort of blocked out. And so there's all these historical accounts from, from people at that time that, uh, that, yeah, had to sort of suffer without the sun during that time. And obviously, a lot of of crops failed and yeah there was a lot of difficulty so um so she traced the lives of a number of different people during that time uh, including the the author Mary Shelley who was living in Switzerland during the time and uh, and so yeah I think it's really interesting historical uh, subject matter but also interesting in that it's probably one of the rare occasions in history where a a single event sort of united the world because everyone was sort of involved in this this concern. You know, I mean, people have talked about recently how this recent events are sort of like wartime and that a lot of people are involved. But, you know, even during World War One and World War Two, not the entire world was involved in that. But during this epidemic that we're currently experiencing, the entire world is involved in this and and is, uh, you know, subject to um, the the, uh, the restrictions and the difficulties that are being caused by it. So I think it's quite interesting that, yeah, this is another incidence where uh, the entirety of civilization was united uh, because of this one problem or were experiencing, you know, similar difficulties. And this 
an author I've been really uh, yeah, keen to, to try. I think this is her second novel, and her first novel was also a historical novel. But uh, yeah, so I'm keen to read this soon. How Much of These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Jane. Uh, this novel, a lot of people have been talking about. You can see on the, the cover of it, there's lots of blurbs um, from famous writers. And, uh, and so, yeah, this is another historical novel that concerns the gold rush in the United States. And, uh, and it's about a brother and sister who are Chinese American immigrants and about their, their journey um, across the, the country carrying their dead father. Uh, so it sounds like a very gripping story. And yeah, I'm very curious to read this. Barn 8 by Deb Olin Unferth. Uh, this is a novel about a chicken factory and a group of animal rights activists who try to liberate the chickens from this factory. So thousands and thousands of chickens are suddenly set out into the wild and uh, this causes a lot of problems and has uh, unintended consequences. So yeah, it's about the issue of animal rights and Jenny Offal uh, says of this novel, come for the brilliant insights about our faltering civilization Stay for the revolutionaries and the chickens. Conjure Women by Afia Atakora. Um, interestingly, this author uh, was born in the United Kingdom, uh, but she was raised and lives in the United States. Um, so this is a novel uh, set during the, the Civil War and during in the American South um, on a plantation and mainly involves the story of three different women. Uh, one is a, a slave um, who is a midwife and um, uh, and a healer, and she passes on her knowledge to her daughter, um, who finds it very difficult to transition um, between a uh, time during the Civil War and then after the, the Civil War. And it also um, involves a white woman who lives on that plantation and is about sort of the, the bond between these, these different women. And uh, yeah, I just think it sounds like a really interesting plot for a story. So I'm hoping to read this very soon. No Modernism Without Lesbians by Diana Suhami. I love the, the title. And this is a nonfiction book about Paris in the early 1900s. Famously, this was a really uh, exciting artistic movement and uh, and place to, to be during this time because there was lots of writers and visual artists and philosophers all working together and collaborating and fighting and having sex with each other. And many of them were lesbians. And this book focuses on four of them, including uh, Sylvia Beach and uh, Breyer, uh, Natalie Barney, and uh, Gertrude Stein, of course, one of the most like famous uh, lesbian writers of the, the 20th century. And uh, and so, yeah, really interestingly, like this has been covered somewhat in, in the past, but, uh, but yeah, this really focuses on these particular artists. And the, um, the, the author, Juna Barnes, in the past, she uh, published this book called Ladies' Almanac, um, which sort of satirizes this whole group of lesbians um, that lived together in this community during this this time. And Juna Barnes was a lover of Natalie Barney um, and uh, famously wrote her uh, her novel Nightwood um, talking about that that breakup and the, the pain of, of that relationship. So yeah, I think it's just an absolutely fascinating time. So yeah, I'd be really interested and eager to read more about it. Nobody Will Tell You This But Me by Bess Kalb. Uh, another great title. Um, so this is a, a memoir uh, where the the, um, the writer talks about her relationship with her grandmother. And uh, over many years, um, her grandmother left her many, many voicemails messages and she saved all of these and so she she uses them as a starting point to, to transcribe some of them um, into this memoir and then uh, yeah talk about her relationship with her um, so it goes through her her family life and what she learned from her grandmother and uh, yeah includes a lot of photos and uh, and yeah conversations that they had with each other so I just think it sounds like a really lovely subject matter love after love by Ingrid Persaud this is a, a novel um, set in Trinidad and involves a household with an unconventional family who lives there 
and then one evening, one drunken evening, a lot of secrets come out and this has an explosive effect within the, the family. And so it's about the, the consequences of that. And I heard the author read from this at an event um, a few months ago. Um, it sounded like a really uh, yeah, powerful novel and it um, has blurbs from lots of really great writers like Marlon James and Rachel Joyce and Andre Osman and Claire Adam. Um, so yeah, very keen to read this novel. Exciting Times by, uh, and I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce this, I, I often get Irish names wrong, so Noise Dolan, no, Noise Dolan, um, sorry, uh, but this is a, a debut novel, um, it's set in Hong Kong and involves basically a love triangle of three different people who get involved with each other, so there's an Irish woman who uh, moves there to Hong Kong to teach and um, she gets involved with, with a man and then she meets a, a woman who sort of comes between them. So that's why there's this pictorial representation of three different toothbrushes. And um, so, uh, yeah, I'm very keen to, to read Irish, new Irish fiction. Hinton by Mark Blacklock. Uh, this is another uh, sort of west to east um, story because uh, it involves a, a British family that moves to Japan and the father of the family is a physicist and he's studying uh, things to do with the fourth dimension or speculations about the, the fourth dimension and uh, it's about how his family gets sort of drawn into uh, his studies and uh, and to a lot of the scientific work that he he does and uh, I just love the cover of this novel. Artemisia by uh, Anna Banti and um, this is a reprint of a novel that was first published in 1947 and this meant to be a great classic of Italian literature though I, I'd never heard of it um, before but um, but Susan Sontag had uh, written an essay about it so it's included here um, as uh, as a forward to the story so it's about a, a woman from the 1600s um, who was a a visual artist and uh, and how she basically gave up her family life and everything to just concentrate and devote herself to her art and so it's about how that was you know quite unconventional for the time obviously and the uh, the struggles and the the problems that she encountered then i have another book about art and uh, this is a non-fiction book and a collection of essays by olivia lane uh, called funny weather art in an emergency and uh, it couldn't be more timely um, to have a, a book come out with this uh, title and talking about the importance of art during a time of, of social emergency and uh, and so uh, Olivia Lane is uh, I, I adore her writing and her um, her nonfiction book the the lonely city I thought was so powerful and her her short novel called crudo and uh, she's also a critic so this collects a lot of her journalism and essays that she's published over the years um, about some visual artists including Derek Jarman and uh, Giorgio O'Keefe and David Hockney and uh, but also um, some writers so she writes about Sally Rooney and uh, Maggie Nelson and uh, Deborah Levy so yeah um, her her thoughts on all of these modern artists but uh, but then also yeah some more general essays like there's another their essay in here about loneliness and uh, and uh, yeah different things to do with with uh, the arts and society and uh, yeah so um so I'm very keen to read more of her I think this is a, a book that I'll just sort of want to dip in and out of and read essays at different times and then finally the publisher Scepter uh, kindly got in touch with me and asked me if I would be interested in reading more of the work by Sejan the uh, the Icelandic writer and uh, I've only read his book Moonstone um, which is really powerful interesting strange strange novel uh, but really interesting and uh, so yeah I would be keen to read more by him and uh, so they sent me a, a group of his his books so um, I love the cover of of the blue fox and uh, and I you know, he he feels like one of these writers that you definitely need to be in the mood to, to read his writing because it can be quite like complex and tricksy in its in its style. And I tried to read his his novel from the mouth of the whale before and I just sort of got 
caught up in it and yeah, couldn't really get into it at the time. I think it just wasn't quite the right time for me. Um, but then there's his novel Codex 1962, which I've heard from some people is really uh, amazing, um, but it's almost 500 pages long. So unlike most of his books, which are, you know, quite slim and brief, um, this is a more sustained book. So uh, those are all the books I want to talk about. Um, let me know your um, if you've read any of these or your thoughts on them or you're interested in reading them now or uh, if you just want to have a chat in the comments below like I said you know during this time it's all a bit wacky and uh, and you know I'm sure you're feeling a lot of the things that that I'm feeling too about just a bit glum about it all so uh, so we can have a chat about that as well but I hope you're doing well hope you're keeping safe and I'll speak to you again soon take care everyone